Hello, Minachi. Hi. Hi, Sangeeta. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, viewers. Greetings from Toronto. Sangeeta here, back with the 15th episode of the limited video series of literary and critical conversations. Today we have an important USA-based guest with us, Dr. Minakshi Mohan, who is an educator, critic, reviewer, painter, and poet. On behalf of Setu, I extend a hearty welcome to her. The idea behind running this video series is to showcase the over of the literatures and the artists. I now present to you her brief intro. Dr. Minakshi Mohan is a freelance writer, art critic, reviewer, children's writer, painter, and poet. She is bilingual and writes in English and Hindi. She has taught at universities in Chicago, Boston, and more recently, Towson University in Maryland. Her specialty is early childhood leadership and advocacy. She has published widely in this area and presented numerous papers and workshops. Her academic writings and books include Motivational Learning and Art Integrated Curriculum. What is education, art, and the emergence of literacy and motivation? Stanford University digitally houses her writings in its initiative of life in quarantine. She is on the editorial team for inquiry in education, a peer reviewed journal published by the National Louis University, Chicago, Illinois. As an editorial member, she reviews, edits, writes articles, and does academic book reviews and editorials. In creative writing, she has published children's picture books titled Gift, The Rainbow in My Room, and The Rebirth of the Demon. She has co-edited an anthology of poems for children. She has edited a book of poems of Shitij Mohan, Tamam Shud, and an anthology of 70 poets, Tipistry of Women in Indian Mythology in 2022. The DC South Asian Literary Council nominated her as a featured author in 2023. Potomac Library houses her books, The Rebirth of the Demon and Tapestry of Women in Indian Mythology. Minakshi has several solo art exhibits, exhibits in the Maryland area, including one in the Potomac Library, Maryland in 2021. Currently, too, Potomac is showcasing her art for September 2023. She has been awarded as a dedicated editorial board member of a journal published by National Louis University, Chicago, Illinois. Selected twice in Who is Who Among American Teachers, has received certificates for excellence in teaching by Roosevelt University, Chicago. Illinois and Montgomery College, Maryland. Dr. Minakshi Mohan lives in Maryland, USA. To know more about her, 
you can visit www.minakshimohan.com. With this, I extend a hearty welcome to her for the 15th episode of the limited video series of literary and critical conversations. Welcome, Dr. Minakshi Mohan. Oh, wow. Thank you, Sangeeta, for such an elaborate introduction and for inviting me on this platform. I'm really honored. I also wanted to express my gratitude and uh, congratulations to you, the Setu team, um, you know, Dr. Sunil Sharma and Anurag Sharma for whatever you guys are doing to enhance literacy and introducing new, um, you know, seasoned writers, poets, artists, and also, uh, also bringing forth some of the emerging ones. That's really a great thing. So, um, you know, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure to host eminent poets, artists like you, Dr. Mohan. To set the tone, I now read out a short poem of hers published in the anthology, Let Love Heal the World. The poem is titled, Let the Symphony of Life Dance with an Unrelenting Crescendo. Life is a book of verses wrapped in melodies of love, glory, and sadness. Between tears and laughs, they weave a story. The symphony of life moves on with an unrelenting crescendo, with the sun and moon as our constant companions. I was so moved to read this poem when I found it online, Dr. Mohan, that I thought I should read this out as your signature poem. Uh, thank you so much. Well, Dr. Mohan, uh, at the outset, please let me know about your initial journey from India to America. Thank you, Sangeeta. Actually, I can write the whole memoir on that. I came to this country soon after my bachelor's degree from Calcutta, India, Shitej, my husband, uh, and my family actually knew each other for a long time, maybe even before my birth. Mm -hmm. But uh, Shitej and I had not met as adults, maybe in childhood we may have met, but not as adults. He was studying here in the USA and I was in college. One day my mother-in-law just came to see me in Calcutta. I was just getting out of my class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, like a few days later, three, uh, you know, a few weeks later, Shitej arrived. We got engaged on the same day. You would not believe. And within three weeks, we were married. And uh, five days after my marriage, I was in New York in the deep snow. <laughs> so oh. that was the beginning of my coming to this country, of course. And I was quite young at that time, you know, and, you know. That's uh, a fascinating story. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, beginning was hard because it was a new culture, new country. I hardly knew anybody. Husband was new. Everything was new for me. So it was a big adjustment. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I really, really missed my, used to miss my parents. Uh, and the phone calls, everything was so expensive in those days. So it was hard, but soon after my children came along in our lives and, uh, you know, as the years passed by, things smoothed out a little bit and then we got more adjusted to the life here. So mm -hmm. that was the basically the story of uh, my life here. Know, so it I was a very good in confluence of stars, yeah. your young age and support of your family and your own determination to come to America, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for an artist, childhood influences are very important. So what kind of continuities were there in your early life in India and later life in America? Yeah, so it's very true. Childhood influences are important. I came from a family uh, where there was a lot of emphasis uh, given to education. Mm -hmm. My mother was a published writer herself, poet, artist. Mm -hmm. Some of her murals are still hanging in uh, in Birla auditoriums near Calcutta. You know, they are still there. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So my interest in writing and art started when I was very young. In fact, some of my stories got published when I was still in college. So I was still writing and uh -huh. doing art and all that stuff from very beginning. Then I luckily, see. it happened that I got married in a family where education was considered important too. You know, mm -hmm. my mother-in-law, who was from Aligarh, was one of the first Hindu graduate from the Aligarh University. She had two master's degree. Oh, and really? She was an honorary member of the Aligarh Alumni Association here in the Washington, D.C. area. Great. Um, I believe in um, Yuri Braun Brenner's um, theory of ecological theory that both micro and macro environment influence the development a lot. So I would say my micro environment was my family, you know, how I got the foundation and mm -hmm. macro, how I got exposed to everything, mm -hmm. you know, basically. So the foundation of art and writing was already there. But after coming here between um, new country, new life adjustments, family, work, studies, and those interests were, you know, all that interests were a little bit in a limbo for a while. Oh. Uh, I did write and paint for my own. You know, I always did that. But actually in limelight, I basically, I came once COVID started and we were more online, you know. So yeah. this is how I came to you know yeah we came to know about and, you that yeah. time only i was still publishing but still in those days you know those publishing were not so exposed you know it's just for our own thing you know but still you know so basically the limelight came into once we get got so much into online stuff you know mm -hmm. during covid time dr mohan would you like to read out a poem of yours here or mm -hmm. later yeah, actually, th this book is very important to me because this was the first anthology where I published my poem. It is um, I see. It's edited by Vikram Chopra. Unfortunately, he is no more, but very excellent. Very, in, you know, I really mm -hmm. like him a lot. So actually, that when he requested me to write something, I, you know, I hope you can see it. Uh, this is the painting. This is my painting. That's so my lovely. this poem is based on this painting. It's very symbolic. Mm -hmm. It sort of conveys peace and positivity. So I will read out my poem actually. I'll show you the picture and I'll read out. I wrote the poem. Yeah, I remember you had posted, I think, on the Facebook. Yeah, I think I may have. When the sun hides beneath the beneath the folds of the ocean, it leaves behind a lustrous brilliance. When the moon peeks through the veils of boats, emitting its silvery light, silvery light, it effaces the Cimmerian blue and lies ahead. When masts rise tall and fearless in the tumultuous water of times, they vaticinate strength. When seagulls soar with shimmering wings, they urge courage to bring forth the rhythm of life. Muffled, muffled winds in a still world Whisper safe, softly, there is yet another tomorrow with the brilliance of the radiant sun. Lovely. That's a poem full of hope. Uh, yeah, it is hope and positivity and hope is a big thing, you know? Yeah. You, you are spreading positivity and hope through your words. So yeah. what would be better than yeah. that? Uh, well, um, you have three children's picture books published, have co-edited an anthology of poems for children, and your stories and poems for children appear regularly in different journals and anthologies. So how different is writing for the children and for an adult audience? What are the overarching themes in your children's writings? Maybe okay. that. Uh, as you have said about my children's books, yes, children are my passion. Mm -hmm. Even from the time my children were young, you know, I used to make up stories, you know, for, for them. Just, just, just like that, I will come up with, with a story. As for the second question, you know, how children's writing is different than adult, it is very different. First of all, the tone and voice, vocabulary, st st uh, the length of the story, everything is different. The age, depending on the age levels of children. Mm -hmm. uh, children are writing, children writing is shorter. 
and uh, it's written in a uh, in a first person narrative you mm -hmm. know the, the the protagonist is, is himself is the one who sort of is the um, the whole story is centered around the protagonist actually and children find their own solution to the problem adult writing could move around different themes you know like one chapter could talk about something else the other chapter could talk about something else too but not in children's writing which is all one theme according to the protagonist you know how he takes the story uh, and adult writing is very different depending on what you're writing about travel log or whatever the language is also di different but whatever one is writing one should read and research a lot that is what you know is very important I'm a researcher, you know, I like to research a lot too. Um, as for my tapestry woman, I had to do a lot of research myself, mm -hmm. you know, for my, the poems on Shanta Devi, Amrapali and Arundhati, and not only mine, it was a big learning experience for me, but for the poems mm -hmm. that other people sent, I wanted to know what exactly, you know, they were writing about, and there was so much research involved. Suppose if you were to write for, Children, you know, I'm thinking that is my one of my next thing that I'm thinking about mm -hmm. writing a logical story about children. My whole thing will be very different. The tone, the voice, the, you know, the, the length of the story, the dialogue we speak, everything will be different. So there is a big difference between adult writing and children writing. Mm -hmm. And as for the second question, you know, your second question, children books are, for me, children books are varied too, like my art. You know, it's on different themes. I love to watch and observe children. And my stories basically come from children themselves, you know, sometimes. In my rainbow, in my room, this is the book. In the rainbow, in my room. Uh, That's so cute. Yeah. I was, I, I was watching my four-year-old grandson trying to run to catch the prism of rainbow that reflected through the sunlight passing through the chandelier in my dining room. And he was running around trying to catch the whole the rainbow. Oh. So basically, uh, you know, the thing was like he finally he wanted to catch it. Finally, he comes up with his own solution how yeah. to catch it. You know, how can you catch a rainbow? You know, Piaget. Uh, Piaget is one of the theories that I really, you know, I'm very much a fan of his cognitive development theory. He he comes up with his. Uh, he said the children are explorer and learner they come up with their own solutions to solve a problem, okay? Mm -hmm. And yeah. Vygotsky is another cognitive development theorist also, but he thinks adults and children, uh, adults could be like the scaffolding or like a structure, okay? They can enhance I mean, children's learning. Like for example, this rainbow book, you know, mm -hmm. um, Avi is that he's the protagonist. He he finds a solution to solve the problem how to catch the rainbow. I'm not telling you how he does it. Everybody, you will have to read the story. <laughs> so, but um, it, for Vygotsky, the uh, teachers could ask children the questions. Okay, mm -hmm. and let them think and imagine what are some other ways you can do. You could have done it. How how could you have caught the rainbow? You know. So these are the things. So that is the difference between that. And environment plays a very important role. According to Malaguzi, he is another, the Reggio Emilia thing, I'm very fan of him also. Uh, he said, environment is the invisible teacher. So how you create the environment, teacher, you know, all these things are important in children's learning. Well, so you try to explore how children's cognitive reasoning develops through trial and error and in their interactions with yeah. the environment. Imaginative people, you know, the fantasy and reality are all mixed up in there. For my granddaughter, uh, to this morning, my actually just sharing one story. This morning, my my daughter just sent me a text message. Did you tell Veda gods are men? He, I said, and we are having an argument that God could be she and he also. Oh. <laughs> and so, so it's like you know how children think. You know that is yeah. the thing. You know basically. And it's so funny. firing up their imagination is the ultimate goal right and then they start thinking and finding solutions oh, and one day I was just telling her a story about um, you know are you my mother I don't know if you have read that story or not it's a children's story it's a it's a, a bird that comes out of an egg you know and then the egg while the mother is gone out to look for the food the little baby bird comes out and he's going around looking for uh, for his mother so 
here I meet Alvida. So the egg jumped and jumped and broke. And then what happened, Veda? And Veda came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. Even you become a child with children. You have to become a child. You have to think like children, you know, start, you know, so. Yeah. So I really enjoyed, one has to really enjoy being with children in order to write for children. So. And gift is my another story that's also based on my personal yeah. experiences. So. Mm -hmm. so in 2022, you edited Tapestry of Women in Indian Mythology, an anthology of 70 ports. Yes. Later, DC South Asian Arts and Literary Council invited you to present on this both virtually and in person for its literary festival in the DC area. It is still housed in Potomac Library, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so what motivated you to think of such a challenging project, bringing mythology to the contemporary audience? Thank you. That's a very good question. I love mythology. I grew up hearing stories, mythological stories from my parents from my, from my very childhood. And I have also read a lot about Greek and Roman mythology. Then I realized, uh, there is hardly anything written about so many unsung ancient Indian women, you know, and that was one reason why I sort of thought of this thing here. Second, uh, through this book, I wanted to bring women's stories alive, their, 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 you know, lives of rocks and rivulets, struggles and crimes, you know, all that story, I wanted to bring it out before the audience. I consider this book as an awakening call. And, uh, and to provide that and, and to prove that feminism is not a new phenomenon, but it is as old as the prehistoric times. Mm -hmm. And just to share a story, you know, I want to share one of the personal story. I remember once long time ago as a kid, I was sitting on my balcony with my father and he pointed out to the, to the big dipper, you know, in the sky. Then he told me that they are actually seven munis. Uh, he showed me a slightly smaller star star next to another shining star. And he told me, you know, that is Arundhati. Next to him is Vashishtamuni, her husband. They had a perfect balanced marriage. And uh, for today's world, I thought this concept is so important. People should know about and be proud of their heritage. And also just the beginning of my anthology here that I write, wrote is um, the very first um, sentence is Yatra Naryas Tu Pujante Tatra Devata. God recites where women are respected. So, you know, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring women's stories, you know, before the audience. Yeah. Because, and this is actually makes it one of a kind book because there is still not any book so compiled about so many different women's stories. If you, and I think you have the book too. So, you, yes. You, yeah, you can see. I that. have it. I have contributed also to it. Oh, if my poems right. have got published in it. Right, exactly. So it's a product of intense research. I know that. And it's more than a collection of poems. It has stories of prehistoric ancient women, some very familiar and yeah. some completely unknown. Unknown, yeah. Basically, so yeah. that's... that's um, very important record you have created right. for all of us for the posterity. Your doctoral thesis is on early childhood leadership and advocacy. You are on the editorial team for Inquiry in Education, a peer-reviewed journal published by National Louis University, Chicago, Illinois, and have academic writings on education well, please comment on the current state of early education in the U.S. Dr. Okay, uh, uh, writing and uh, <clears throat> writing and art has been my passion since my early childhood. From the time I learned to hold pencil, my mother was an excellent artist, writer, uh, poet, and I was very much influenced by her. Since early childhood, I have been painting using different media, what oil, watercolor, you know, and all those things in, in there. Um, actually, I can quote that Thomas Merton said, art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. 
um, current status of early childhood. I mean, this that's the question, right? Current status of um, current state of early uh, education in the U.S. Yeah, and so I would say it varies from where you are. You know, where in you know which part of the country you are and where what location you are. It depends. You know, it uh, so the you know early childhood is you know that is where you know it tells you. Uh, what kind of education children get actually, basically, I can say that, you know, like in my area, there are very nice, good schools, but there are some areas in the USA where there are not so many good schools. So that is the current thing. It sort of varies. Uh, there are very good organizations like NACI, National Association for the Education of Young Children. And there is another organization called Exceptional Children. And uh, there is UNICEF has also uh, sort of stress the importance of early childhood education. So there are a lot of research going on in this field. And many, many schools follow different philosophy. There is Montessori school. There is a Reggio Emilia, which is very art-based school, which is, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, and then there is a inquiry-based school. There is play-based school. And um, my, my granddaughter goes to a school which is called NCRC, which is National Children Research Center. So they mingle different philosophies in their teaching children and they really learn a lot. It's really fascinating how children grow and learn in such environment. Mm -hmm. So I, um, and I've already talked about some of the areas in USA, which is like not so, so enriched in, in there because of being poor and parents are not so educated. So not so much emphasis is given there. And like, you know, Maslow, uh, you must have heard of his Maslow name. Stereo. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the basic need is food and love and all that. That has to be satisfied in order to go ahead in life, you know. So, so, so that area, those areas need a lot of work, government support, people support, whatever support anybody can give. So those are that. So all I can say it varies, but there is a, more awakening nowadays and a very high demand for early childhood education because now people realize much more that the founding years are the most important years in one's life as plato said the beginning is the most important thing in a child's life and um, if you must have heard of chomsky noam chomsky yeah. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of research in language development and all that. And actually... Signifier you know, signified. That yeah. was his theory. Even when mother is like a pregnant, you know, if she's like listening to music or reading a lot or reading aloud or whatever it is, the child absorbs even from, from the womb, actually, you know. And some experiments have been done on that. And we have old mythological story. How about the early, I mean, my news story? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Manu knew how to get inside the chakra view, but he didn't get, didn't know how to get out of chakra view. Yeah. His, when Arjun was telling that story to his wife, he fell asleep. So you can just see, you know, there is some, some importance there. And they say zero to five years is the year time when children's brain grow uh, the most in the whole human development. You know, so the, from, those from zero to five. Five, yeah. Yeah, five years. And so they learn a lot, they absorb a lot, they can learn different languages at the same time, you know. So try to expose them as much as you can. And, you know, and one should not hesitate in using difficult words with children, you know. Like, you know, many people, they start doing children talk, you know, it's not necessary. Children learn, you know, children learn very difficult words as well, you know, mm -hmm. and know the meaning. But it has to be explained in a way that it is developmentally appropriate. That's all. That's true. So, so very, the early years are very important, you know. Yeah, contextually, you have to uh, develop their vocabulary. Right. Yeah, and emphasize on the words. On the words. Yeah. yeah. Being a language teacher, I know uh, a lot of it. I used to teach even uh, functional English to my undergrad students. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, and these structuralist theories also are so engaging. Right. Chomsky's, exactly. as you mentioned just now. Yeah. Yeah. So these are very valid observations and coming from a well-known scholar and educationist like you. Yeah. They are all the more valuable. Yeah. So Thanks one thing. Sharing. Yeah. Just sharing one little thing with my granddaughter. I used to teach 
my students as well but with my granddaughter we had a like a little building coming up next to my daughter's house they were I from see. the scratch they took out the whole thing off and they're structuring the so i told her let's document it you know let's document so we started documenting what happened in the first stage what happened in the second stage what happened in third stage and how the house came up you know so it's like a documentation is also very important in children and then once they do it you know another thing in Reggio Emilia that I really really enjoy and liked it is let children you know let them expose to different themes and everything and let them write about a story and then make them feel important put them like in author's chair okay you are the author of the day and let's share your stories you know with the what you wrote and let other people comment okay I like your dialogue I like this part of learning you know so great in 2021, you had several solo art exhibits in the Maryland area, including one in the Potomac Library. Potomac Library is currently too showcasing your art for September 2023. And Setu too has done that in May 2022. Yeah, right. Even otherwise, your paintings keep appearing in journals and anthologies and they serve as book covers from time to time. So let us know since when did you start exploring painting as an art of expression? And what are the genre themes of your paintings? Okay, so um, writing and art has been my passion since my early childhood, like I you know, said that before. I learned to, uh, I learned to start painting since the time I started learning to hold pencil. Um, my mother was an excellent artist, which I also said her influence was very great on me. You know, I used mm -hmm. to just, she would, you know, I would like to do whatever, you know, it, like um, Yuri Braun Frank Brenner said, you know, micro -envi environment is important. So I used to see that at home and I started doing that too. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, I have been doing different type of, I have done different kinds of art. I don't know if you can see, can you see? Yes. Uh, the rickshawala is my oil <laughs> painting. I mean, I have to choose some of the small ones so I can put it here because some of my oil pens, paintings are very big. And the other one, that one is my pen and ink art, you know, which I do. It. And mm -hmm. uh, this one, which actually I did for Setu on Dr. Sharma's request. This is on the theme of autumn. And okay. I just did. This That's is my lovely. water, water, yeah. water color. This is my watercolor. Yeah, different colors because in autumn you really see some green leaves and yeah. some drying so, up. Right. Yeah. So I do different themes. I have done some, um, you know, charcoal painting, some, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different type of thing. Uh, I've also done fabric painting. Also. So mm -hmm. I use different media in using my painting. As far as my uh, art and writing, it's, they, are, they vary in style. I do not label them into constricted categories of isms or ists. You know, I don't like to do that. I do admire the paintings of uh, impressionist and post-impressionist and expressionist artists. You know, whatever. Uh, I, I, my art tells a story. You know, and I like to, even if it is abstract, I want to find the meaning out of it. You know, I mean, I don't understand. Some of some of the abstract painting these days are like just pouring the paint over in different colors. Yeah, yeah. I don't understand that. You know, I mean, yeah. I would like some of my ab painters, uh, friends here, they do abstract painting, but there is a meaning out of it. You can draw it. You know, it's like a, you know, so um, so. So you communicate like through your painting. Yeah, there right. Should always be some yeah. message behind the painting as I, well. You mean to say exactly. So I don't constrict my art to any any limited thing. I paint in whatever I want to. And I can actually uh, put my art, I can say some of the themes that is behind my art is a moment in life. That inspiration comes from a special moments like my like my poems, you know, like I did something that inspires me to write. And sometimes I like to practice after the great masters, you know, like Vermeer or Van Gogh or Monet. You know, mm. I like to sort of copy. That's a learning experience too for me. So I like to do that. Some of my paintings sort of convey peace and serenity, like this poem, that boat painting I 
did that and I took it from the point of view of like a more like a peace and serenity thing and then I did the pen and ink card which is something that I developed more recently myself and I try to give it a three-dimensional effect you know mm -hmm. imagery is an important part of my right both writing and art mm -hmm. many times I paint paint then I write some poetry and many times I write poem and put my art and base my art on that one so mm -hmm. that is it great so you always want to communicate something through through your paintings and you con you focus on images yeah and uh, adopt very... expressionist techniques you yeah. mean to say yeah. you can see that yeah my paintings are Wonderful. more expressionist. yeah <laughs> yeah so how is washington dc seen for art and culture is it an enabling one for artistic diversity people of color, people of different ethnicity? I could say it is, but it also depends, you know, how inclusive one wants to be, okay? If you want, one wants to be inclusive and interested in, then they can find a lot of things that's happening here. Because for, for me, I'm involved with the Writer Center. They also have their own theater where they bring in the artists from different backgrounds. So it is very inclusive. And then I am very involved with the DC South Asian Arts and Literary Council. Uh, Global Performing Arts is another one. And I'm a member of Women in Arts. And there are so many other organizations there are, you know, here, here you know, for uh, different kinds of arts. And there are excellent museums here, like African Museum, Museum of the American Indian, National Gallery of Art, Writers, Writer Center also has, you know, also comes up with different themes and that. So I think it's uh, it depends, you know, how inclusive one wants to be and how involved one, one wants to be here. Mm -hmm. you know, Washington is a great area like any other city, I think I would say. Yeah, so yeah. it's good. You have kept yourself involved in all these activities and it's very enabling, you mean to say. Yeah. So treating art and artists well speaks volumes about the country's rich heritage. Yeah. So that's uh, something very good to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Mohan, do you have any projects in the pipeline? Many. <laughs> many projects in the pipeline. So the very first thing that I've been sort of trying to get done is my poetry book because I have so many poetry scattered all over the place. You know, I've not been so very organized. So I have to put them together in a book form and get it published. You know, that is one thing. I'm also a uh, children's, children's story book, but that will be a little different than any other children's book. It will be a picture book, but I want to bring in teachers' resources, how they can use that into different areas of the curriculum, like language arts, art, social studies, you know, that that is the next one i do have a couple of stories already written out i just have to do the resources part done on that one and then also i want to do a coffee table book of my paintings that's the third project and then basically oh i would i'm like i said i'm very interested in mythology that's my another interest and i would like to write something for children's point of view so mm -hmm. these are some of the projects besides all the things going on for different anthologies and journals that I keep writing. So yeah, Wonderful. So it's so good to hear. Um, and I often wonder how fortunate your children and grandchildren are, uh, whose, uh, you know, granny and mother uh, have, has specialized in children's upbringing and children development. So it's so nice and so fortunate for them. Fortunate uh, well, for, uh, yeah. Fortunate for me as well because having a very talented uh, mother. I can understand, yes. And uh, we wish you all the very best for your upcoming projects. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, well, which quote sums you best? So I'm a very spiritual person. Not in the sense of going to temples or believing so much in sadhus and sannyasis. Mm -hmm but believing more in the goodness of my own heart and trying to find some peace and serenity or solitude, whatever. I'm involved with Gita study group and many of my quotes and my poetry sometimes come from Gita. 
So I'm just for the last quote, I would just quote my own very short poem that I wrote, a few lines. It says, yeah. one with the Lord. When my eyes flow rain, yet a streak of ray peaks through the clouds in my heart, I know I'm with you. When I'm discouraged and disheartened, yet with all inhales and exhales, my heart beats own. I know you are with me, loving, caring, and watching over me. How beautiful. Marvelous. Thank you. Uh, can you give us a piece of advice for the budding painters and poets? Sure. <laughs> I can need some advice myself too. <laughs> never give up. And it's never too late to learn. Always keep exploring, learning, and growing. Uh, be willing to experiment and learn from mistakes. And I really like what El Salvador, um, the uh, surrealistic artist said, have no fear of perfection. Hmm. But you will never reach it because there is no such thing as perfection. You know, so that is my advice. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, these are very inspiring words. I appreciate your dedication towards arts and towards children's writings, Dr. Mohan. Conversation with you has been very enriching, very engaging. Thanks for your quality time. Thanks, Thank viewers. Thanks, Dr. Minakshi Mohan. Thanks. Next week, we will be back with yet another distinguished guest. Till then, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, and thank you, everybody. Yeah.